ABCs of NMOSD is a 10-part education podcast series to share knowledge about neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, or NMOSD, a rare relapsing autoimmune disorder that preferentially causes inflammation in the optic nerves and spinal cord. ABCs of NMOSD podcast series is hosted by SRNA, the Siegel Rare Neuroimmune Association, and in collaboration with the Sumira Foundation for NMO, the Connor B. Judge Foundation, and Guthie Jackson Charitable Foundation. This education series is made possible through a patient education grant from Viela Bio. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ABCs of NMOSD podcast series. Today's podcast is entitled, Am I Having a Relapse? My name is Gigi DeFibri from the Siegel Rare Neuroimmune Association, and I will be co-moderating this podcast along with Jacinta Bainey from the Guffey Jackson Charitable Foundation. Hi, everyone. This is Jacinta. Gigi, thank you so much for inviting me to join you today to moderate the podcast very, very uh, honored to do so. Back to Thank you. you. Thank you so much for joining us. This podcast is being recorded and will be made available on the SRNA website and for download via iTunes. ABCs of NMOSD is made possible through a patient education grant from Viela Bio. Viela Bio is dedicated to the development and commercialization of novel life trans life-changing med medicines for patients with a wide range of autoimmune and severe inflammatory diseases. The company's approach, which targets the underlying molecular pathogenesis of a disease, is aimed at enabling the development of more precise therapies, identifying patients more likely to respond to treatment, and pursuing multiple indications for each product candidate. For additional information about Viella, please visit vielabio.com. For today's podcast, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Sean Piddock and Dr. Dean Wingerton. Dr. Sean Piddock is Professor of Neurology, Director of the Neuroimmunology Laboratory, and the Center for MS and Autoimmune Neurology at the Mayo Clinic. Dr. Dean Wingerton is Professor and Chair of the Department of Neurology at Mayo Clinic in Phoenix and Scottsdale, Arizona. Welcome and thank you both so much for joining us today. Thanks very much for having us. Indeed, thank you. Thank you. So to start, I know this is a complicated topic, um, but if we could just begin by talking a little bit about how a relapse is defined and how this might be different from something like a pseudo relapse. Dr. Pick, do you mind starting? Sure. Um, well, NMOSD is really characterized by having relapses of neurologic dysfunction and we really define a relapse as a kind of a new uh, area or episode of inflammation in the central nervous system that results in symptoms. And in NMOSD, the types of relapses that we generally see are mainly three types of relapses. Um, areas of inflammation of the optic nerve, uh, which can cause vision loss and pain in the eye. Um, areas of inflammation in the spinal cord, which can cause what we call myelitis or um, difficulties with uh, motor function or sensory function in the legs, sometimes bladder and bowel problems. And then areas of inflammation in the back of the brain in an area called the aeroprostrema, where patients can sometimes have relapses of uh, intractable nausea and vomiting. And these relapses are really related to new areas of inflammation, presumably caused by the antibody targeting uh, the water channel on the astrocyte in those areas you get breakdown in blood-brain barrier, and you get inflammation. And these relapses are kind of considered true relapses. Whereas when we talk about pseudo relapses, what we're talking about really is just the development of symptoms that oftentimes relate to um, an older or previous area of damage. But that uh, area of damage is irritated by something systemically happening in the body. For example, if somebody has an infection and their temperature goes up, they can sometimes develop symptoms that they had when they had the relapse. Uh, but once the uh, fever or the urinary tract infection, et cetera, is treated, then those symptoms resolve. So that's really what we mean between relapses and pseudo relapses. Mm 
Great, thank you. And then Dr. Winter, do you have anything to add to that? That was a great introduction. I think um, <clears throat> as neurologists, the distinction is extremely important because a relapse means the disease is active, that there's active inflammation, and that's usually actionable. You need to do something about that. Um, but if we conclude that it's a pseudo relapse, um, then it's it's not. And and we'll probably go into more detail about that. Great, Gigi, um, ready for the next question? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, the next question, one of the patients writes in, what are the symptoms a person with NMOSD should look out for that may indicate they're having a relapse? And uh, Dean, I'll turn to you this time to go first, please. Okay, sure. Well, <clears throat> Dr. Pittock has introduced this a little bit, but um, most of the time what tells a person with the disease and tells us as neurologists that a person may be having a relapse is the emergence of uh, a new symptom or new pattern of symptoms that's consistent with uh, the activity of the disease. So Dr. Pittock outlined the three most common types of attacks affecting the optic nerve, the spinal cord, or the brain stem, this area called the area postrema, also called the vomiting center sometimes. And so <clears throat> for usually the first indication that something is happening is the person recognizing that a, a brand new symptom or brand new pattern of symptoms has started. Now, one of the things about a, an attack or a relapse, and I guess it's important to know that those terms are used interchangeably. People usually talk about attacks, relapses, sometimes exacerbations. They all essentially mean the same thing. But um, a, a new symptom that develops and persists. Um, now, sometimes you might hear or read that a symptom has to last for 24 hours for it to meet the criteria to be an attack. And that's an arbitrary definition. And it's one that sometimes is helpful, but um, I'll give you a couple of examples. So if somebody awakes one morning and they have pain and significant visual loss in one eye, well, that would be uh, something that would certainly raise concern of a new attack of optic neuritis. <clears throat> it's new, uh, it's consistent with new activity of the disease. Um, I wouldn't advise waiting 24 hours to see whether that would resolve before um, seeking a medical care. Um, on the other hand, uh, some, some, somebody might have a history of having optic neuritis and let's say their vision got partially better and they were left with uh, a, a bit of a of, of a visual blurring or visual loss. Um, and if they notice that that same eye is affected with the change in vision, but it's a pattern of visual change that they haven't experienced before, really distinctly different than what happened to them the first time, then that's the potential symptom of a relapse. Um, so overall, the most common symptoms are going to be related to vision. Uh, they're going to be related to weakness, numbness, sometimes pain or change in bladder or bowel function. That's all related to the spinal cord. And then sometimes those attacks in the brainstem or that uh, can cause nausea, vomiting, or sometimes hiccups. Um, those are typically symptoms that need to persist longer before you know you would necessarily reach the conclusion that they were NMO because being nauseated is something that we all experience occasionally. So it's a little bit different for each symptom and, uh, and how it develops in the pattern, but those are by far the most common general presentations. Thank you so much, Dr. Wingerchuk. Dr. Pittock? Uh, would you have something, anything you'd like to add, please? No, I think I think Dean's covered that question very nicely. Okay. Great, thank you.
And so, we, you know, we talked a bit about the uh, potential symptoms of relapse that are related to the central nervous system. Um, but are there any sort of symptoms of relapse that might not be related? For example, um, stomach issues, I know you talked about nausea, but gut issues or fever, uh, increased heat or cold sensitivity, uh, Dr. Pittick? Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> well, you know, um, when we started doing a lot of the studies on uh, intractable nausea and vomiting, um, at Mayo and, and in Japan, they've been studying this for many years before that. Um, a lot of these patients, when they were having uh, attacks of aeriposterema, in other words, they were having episodes of intractable nausea and vomiting, many of these patients underwent extensive workup. In fact, most of them presented to gastroenterologists for evaluations and had you know, upper GI endoscopies, lower GI endoscopies, CT scans, etc. cetera. Um, and generally, it was ultimately found that these episodes of intractable nausea and vomiting were generally related to attacks that were occurring in the area of stream and not relating to local gut problems. Um, the question of whether or not there could be gastrointestinal dysmotility because of autonomic dysfunction in NMOSD has been raised and potentially could be playing a role. Um, but certainly gut symptoms can be present in patients with NMOSD, but not related to relapse of the central nervous system inflammatory disorder, but related to potentially side effects of medications. For example, you know, uh, use of steroids on a regular basis can cause gastritis or even stomach ulcer and abdominal pain. Um, their cell sept, for example, can cause uh, diarrhea and abdominal pain in about five to 10% of patients. So those need to be considered in the setting of gut symptoms. And then also remember that in patients with NMOSD, there's a very high frequency of coexisting uh, other uh, autoimmune conditions. So for example, patients with NMOSD have a higher risk of ulcerative colitis, and that also can be a presentation, uh, but not necessarily related to the NMOSD per se, but to a coexisting autoimmune condition. In respect of pain, um, we do sometimes see pain in the setting of a relapse. Uh, for example, sometimes patients can report interscapular pain as the first symptom of transverse myelitis. Sometimes patients can develop uh, tonic spasms that can be painful in their limbs. That can also occur in the setting of a relapse. Uh, but pain generally uh, is a big problem in NMOSD, but it's generally more of a neuropathic pain relating to kind of damage and irritation of nerve fibers uh, in a damaged um, area in the cord from, from a relapse. Um, in terms of heat and cold sensitivity, again, this is very much patient dependent. Um, patients with multiple cirrhosis can have very significant heat and cold sensitivity. Some patients can become very lethargic or have worse symptoms <clears throat> in the setting of heat, oftentimes in the summer. Sometimes we have patients wear you know, cold vests, et cetera, or, or uh, ice vests. Um, that's less of a problem in NMOSD, but it does exist. And it may certainly relate to the fact that when uh, you become overheated, um, that there is an effect on the transmission of the electrical impulse through damaged areas uh, where potentially uh, there's a lack of myelin. Uh, and so those are certainly things to think about uh, in patients with NMOSD. Great. Thank you so much for that overview. Um, Dr. Weintraub, do you have anything to add as well? No, I don't think so. Not to that question. Then we'll go on to the next question, uh, Dr. Weintraub. Can any side effects from NMOSD drugs mimic relapse? Well, the usual situation um, with side effects of medication is uh, aggravating some pre-existing symptoms. Uh, so the, the kind of pseudo relapse or pseudo attack that uh, Sean Pettick described earlier. So <clears throat> for example, sometimes uh, medications, and this is especially true of medications that have an effect on the brain itself. Um, so anticonvulsant medications that might be used for pain or spasms for example, or spasticity medications, um, they can sometimes aggravate or bring out symptoms that people were having before. So it can make a previously weak leg seem temporarily weaker, or maybe a previously affected eye seem more blurry. Uh, 
So usually the, that's the case is that it's, it's, uh, it's, mim it's essentially causing a, a pseudo relapse. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Pitta, anything you would add? No, I have nothing to add to that. Great, thank you both so much. Um, so are, are there any common triggers for a relapse? For example, do relapses often fi follow viral illnesses or bacterial infections? Um, can something like weather or temperature have an effect on relapses, Dr. Pitta? Well, that's a good question. It would be really nice if we could uh, identify definitive triggers for relapse in patients, because then we could get, uh, be ready to, to deal with them. Um, patients will, will report um, their own observations that, for example, they developed a clinical attack um, you know, soon after a vaccination or soon after a viral illness or even a bacterial infection. Um, it's very difficult to say definitively because it's been, it's a, this is a very difficult area to study or investigate because as you know, vaccinations are very common, viral infections are very common. And to make that definitive link between one and the other is difficult. Um, but I suspect that anything that stirs up the immune system, I suspect has the ability to uh, potentially trigger uh, a flare of an immune mediated disorder. Um, I think that a lot more work needs to be done in this area, um, uh, but I, uh, I don't think we can definitively say uh, uh, that uh, one does lead to the other, um, but I suspect it does. Great, thank you. And then Dr. Mirchuk, any, any additional thoughts on, on that? Well, one thing that came to mind, first of all, I agree with everything that Dr. Pittock just said, but um, is, you know, just today I was asked by a, by a patient <clears throat> um, uh, whether stress triggers relapses. And uh, I think that's a particularly common question. Uh, it's also a quite a difficult one to answer for reasons that you might uh, already appreciate because, you know, what's stressful for one person might be not particularly bothersome to another. And there are some people who uh, thrive on, you know, the, on sort of the adrenaline of whatever uncertainty or their work environment. And other people might look at that and think, gee, that, that looks extremely stressful. Um, I think there's, you know, there's good stress and bad stress. And um, I think for people who can eliminate as much of the bad stress as possible, uh, that's helpful. I, I do think sometimes we see <clears throat> uh, stress as a as a cause for fluctuating symptoms, so symptoms that might be left over from a prior attack. And when someone gets very anxious or very stressed, that those symptoms worsen, and that leads them to worry whether they're having an attack. Um, generally, the answer, of course, is no. Thank you so much, Jacinta. Do you want to ask the next question? Thanks so much, really appreciate it. Um, next question, a patient writes in, what should a person with NMOSD do if they think they're having a relapse? Should they go to the emergency room, their general practitioner, their neurologist, et cetera? Let's ask you, Dr. Mirchuk, to comment first. Sure, well, you know, I think it depends a lot on the specific scenario um, because, you know, the the best situation, of course, is if somebody has an established uh, relationship with a neurologist who, um, you know, is knowledgeable about the disease and and can be contacted. Somebody has new symptoms that, um, you know, they've noticed for a couple of days and they want to get advice. I think contacting a neurologist is a very reasonable thing. Um, if somebody has uh, a more acute event or something like loss of vision, something that's progressing quickly, um, maybe doesn't have somebody that they can, you know, communicate with very uh, easily or very quickly, or maybe doesn't have uh, care, uh, consistent care at all, um, then I think the emergency room, you know, might be the best place to go. This is always well, this is sometimes a difficult decision, I suppose, these days in the midst of a COVID pandemic, 
Um, that's another factor to consider before making a trip to the emergency department. But um, you know, sometimes that if there's a an important symptom that's progressing and causing some significant um, uh, impairment of function and is consistent with the kinds of symptoms of NMOSD that we described before, um, the emergency room may be the best place to go. Thank you so much, Dr. Wienerchuk. Dr. Pitta? Yeah, I agree. And I, I think it is important to, um, uh, you know, to try and get uh, medical attention early because we know that, you know, the earlier we get in with treatment, the, the more potentially we can reverse and improve outcome. And also it's very important to be able to have a neurologist uh, be definitive that an attack has occurred because that will play into decision-making as to what uh, attack preventive medication the person should be on um, and whether or not uh, such medication should be changed. So uh, one, you wanna get the diagnosis early, two, you wanna get treated early, and three, you want to use the knowledge of whether or not you have or haven't had an attack to make decisions relating to attack prevention therapy. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so I know we talked a, a bit about this um, at the beginning, um, but you know, at, at what point of experiencing symptoms of a relapse should someone with NMOSD seek medical attention? I know we mentioned kind of the, the 24 hours, um, but you know, are, are there certain symptoms that maybe warrant going to see a physician earlier or, or not? Um, Dr. Pinnock, if you'd like to start. Yeah, I suppose I, I, would have the, I would have the opinion that, you know, if you have NMOSD, it's a serious condition. And um, we know that in NMOSD that it is the attack that causes the disability. And so I think it's very appropriate for patients to be very vigilant and to, um, and to uh, you know, get the appropriate medical care as quickly as possible. Um, NMOSD patients are very um, educated and informed about the types of symptoms that they should be looking out for. And so, you know, if you have NMOSD and you develop pain in an eye and your vision starts to blur, um, I wouldn't tend to be waiting for a long period of time. I would say I want to be seen and I want to get on steroid therapy as soon as possible. Um, now, obviously, you know, there are caveats to that. If you're somebody who has NMOSD and you also have um, ocular migraine, uh, then, you know, if you're just having a typical, you know, uh, visual symptoms of ocular migraine, then you probably can uh, wait it out a little bit to see if that goes away. So I think each individual patient needs to uh, consider their symptoms within the context of other things that they may also suffer from. Uh, but I, I think the earlier you get uh, evaluated, the earlier you get diagnosed, and the earlier you get treatment, the better. Thank you. And Dr. Wiener, any, any additional thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, I recognize, too, that especially for people that are newly diagnosed, this can be a big challenge, right? Because you receive a diagnosis after having gone through you know, some neurologic symptoms that got you there. And um, then you start learning about the importance of relapses and the natural tendency is to, is to be uh, e extremely, pay extremely close attention to everything that happens with your body. And that can be hard to kind of calibrate into understanding, you know, what's, what's normal in the spectrum of, you know, numbness and tingling that comes and goes and visual blurring that comes and goes and when to act. But that's why the education and kind of the descriptions that Dr. Pittock was giving of different types of symptoms and how they evolve is, is so important to help you understand um, when to make the call. Thank you so much, Dr. Wingerchuk. Um, the next question, uh, this patient writes, uh, are there specific tests used to determine that a patient is having a relapse? And if so, what are they? Can you tell us a little bit about them? And uh, Dr. Wigerchuk, I'm going to turn to you first. Well, I'd say the three main tools that are used to determine a relapse are number one, the story. <clears throat> so listening to the symptoms, the particular symptoms and how they've developed and the pattern and the pace over time, et cetera. 
Number two is the examination. Um, so the neurologic examination to determine whether those symptoms have uh, an associate associated change in function that's detectable by the neurologist. If it does, and it, those, those two things fit together, um, that may be all that's required in diagnosing a relapse. Um, the third is MRI. MRI isn't always required. Um, it's, it's very helpful information to have, and in some circumstances it is, it is the arbiter. It, it, it does really provide the objective visual evidence that yes, there's a new lesion or there's a lesion that's lighting up that's in the right place to cause these symptoms. This is an attack. Um, but those three things are all um, interrelated. We know for some patients that um, they'll uh, have, for example, an optic neuritis attack. They have very typical symptoms and we may be able to detect an abnormality on their exam but actually we don't find an abnormality on the MRI just because the MRI is not a very sensitive tool for visualizing an optic nerve, which is very small. So um, that's why it's particularly important to you know, look at the story and the examination and then use the MRI with, um, you know, with appropriate judgment. Those by far are the most important instruments that we use to determine if someone's had an attack or not. Thank you so much. Dr. Pittock, anything you would add? No, I agree. I mean, I think sometimes, you know, you don't necessarily need an MRI uh, to make a diagnosis of a relapse. The MRI potentially can help because it potentially can show you uh, areas of inflammation that may not be relevant or um, coincide with the specific symptoms of the patients. For example, Sometimes a patient will have an optic neuritis, and when you do the MRI scan, you sometimes can see a lesion in the spinal cord that may be asymptomatic. And what does that tell you? Well, it's telling you that there's, there's, there's more of an active inflammatory process going on. And again, it might inform the decisions uh, relating to ultimately what type of um, uh, attack preventive medication you want to use. Because at the end of the day, yes, it's all well and good to deal with the relapses, and it's very appropriate to diagnose them and treat them earlier. But the most important thing we can do is to try and stop them happening in the first place. And so, uh, you know, getting a sense of what the type of relapse the patient is having and also the extent of information that's current, that's present, I think also informs uh, in terms of making decisions related to attack preventive therapies. Great, thank you. And then just, uh, you know, as a follow-up to that, I know you said that MRI isn't necessarily always warranted, but um, at what point should someone push for an MRI if their physician is reluctant to give them one or take their symptoms seriously? And you know, what do you look for in an MRI during a relapse? Are you looking for new lesions or reactivation of old ones? Uh, Dr. Pittick, if you want to expand on, on what yeah, you Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose if I, if I had NMOSD and I thought I was having a relapse, I'd be pretty uh, demanding of, a, of an MRI. Um, you know, in, in multiple sclerosis, we do MRI scans uh, essentially on a yearly basis, even if patients aren't having any symptoms. And um, I think uh, I would argue that uh, imaging in, in uh, NMOSD is even more warranted. Um, so I, I, I think it's very reasonable and appropriate if you feel that you've had an attack and if your doctor actually thinks you may be having an attack, that you have imaging, because as Dean said, it really does firm up the diagnosis. You know, if you're kind of not sure uh, and you see an area of new enhancement in the spinal cord or, uh, that coincides with the symptoms the patient's having, then I think that certainly can be very, very helpful diagnostically. Great, thank you. And Dr. Winger, took anything to add to that as well? No, I think, you know, it really depends on the presentation too. And there may be a very good explanation about why certain symptoms are not related to NMO. Um, and why an MRI may not be needed. It's, I think it's very specific uh, to, the, to the actual uh, symptoms and what, what's developed. Thank you so much. Uh, for Dr. Wingerchuk, does a change in aquaporin-4 antibody levels indicate a relapse? Yeah, it's a great question. I know Dr. Pittock has studied this a lot and he, he, he can tell you the real answer, but I'll tell you that uh, <clears throat> the, my take first, and that is that um, some studies have shown uh, that 
there can be a, a, an increase in the, in the tighter the level of aquaporin for antibodies detectable in blood uh, shortly before uh, a, 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 a relapse or an attack. Um, however, uh, the overall data suggests that this is not a useful way to monitor to the disease for an individual person. Um, and that for most attacks, um, even if you had that data, when you do have the data, um, you, you don't see the titer increase. Now, Dr. Pittock can tell you the real story. Okay, Dr. Pittock. And now for the uh, rest know, of the story. I think that's, you know, it's again, um, you know, uh, in the last year, two groups, both Kazuo Fujara from Japan and our group have published papers saying that antibody levels are not very helpful in the day-to-day -day management of patients with NMOSD. Um, now, there have been papers where some people have reported that, you know, at the time of severe attacks, um, uh, there are increased levels of antibodies in the blood and that those levels correlate, those increases correlate with the length of the lesion on the spinal cord, etc. What I can tell you is we looked, in, we looked at quite large numbers of patients where we uh, where basically we had serial samples, in other words, blood samples collected at different times uh, along the dur dur during the duration of their illness. So we sometimes, you know, samples collected with intervals of many years in between. And then we were also actually able to take blood samples and actually know what was actually happening in that individual patient at the time of the blood sample. So, for example, we might have a blood sample from a patient when they had an attack. We might have a blood sample from a patient when they were in remission. And we might have a blood sample from a patient that was drawn, say, a couple of weeks before they had an attack. And by putting those and uh, taking those samples and measuring the levels of the antibodies at all those different time points and correlating them with the clinical phenotype of the patients, what we found out was that generally uh, it was all over the place. Generally, patient sample levels, their, their, their titers actually remain quite steady uh, throughout the course of their illness. And then there are some patients where, you know, they start on an immunosuppressive medication, they get a drop, and some get a very significant drop, and others don't get much of a drop. And some patients go negative, and others don't. And even some patients that go negative continue to have clinical attacks. So it's kind of all over the place, but overall, there's not a very a good correlation between the antibody levels and um, the clinical course of the patient's disease. Um, and that's kind of the bottom line. Now, the other problems with some of these assays is that, you know, the we're looking at very big changes in titers. So, for example, if you're, if you're kind of diluting a person's sample and you're doing like tenfold dilutions, then, you know, you're, you may not see a, a change. And we didn't see a change when we did that. But, you know, if you look at smaller dilutions, you know, look at the, you know, look at smaller changes in antibody titers, uh, sometimes you can see changes. But overall, I don't think they're, I don't think changes in antibody titers indicate relapse. Thank you so much for that overview. Um, and so the next question is about, you know, how often relapses happen. So to start, you know, what percentage of patients who are diagnosed with NMO will go on to have relapse versus those you know, who don't? Um, and then how often do people with NMO have relapses if they don't use immunosuppressant medications uh, versus when they do? Uh, Dr. Weyerchuk? Yes, those are those are excellent questions. And so, you know, part of it depends on um, the data that one's looking at. Um, you know, historically, NMO was considered what we call a monophasic disease, meaning people typically were described as having the disease if they presented with spinal cord inflammation and optic neuritis affecting both eyes. And that's a particularly rare uh, type of presentation and one that sometimes in certain circumstances seems to be a single attack. But where we are now, especially diagnosing NMOSD with the help of the aquaporin antibody, we know that the vast majority, um, we think 90 plus percent of people, if they have a typical presentation and they have that antibody, and were observed without treatment, that they would eventually relapse. Um, the relapse frequency is highly variable, though. There are some people who have clusters of relapses, you know, maybe 
three or four relapses in a several month period and good um, information that, or good objective data showing that those were relapses and other people who even without treatment have gone uh, many years until their next relapse. Um, what we're looking for as part of research in the field is to understand whether we can, uh, we're pretty good at diagnosing this disease, but uh, need to be better at uh, predicting how it's going to behave over time. Um, and you know, the last question was asking about aquaporin-4 levels. <clears throat> well, those, those levels don't appear to be pretty, uh, very, very good on an individual level for predicting attacks, uh, but there's a lot of work going on now to try to understand whether other markers, for example, other blood tests might be able to do that. Thank you. Dr. Pedek, do you have anything additional? Yeah, no, I, I agree with Dean. Um, actually, um, uh, last year we did a large study, it was a multi-center study, where we looked at uh, 441 patients with NMO ST in uh, the US, the USA, uh, the U, sorry, the US, the UK, Japan, and Martinique, which is a, one of the French, uh, one of the Caribbean islands. And we actually studied uh, 1,976 attacks in 441 patients. And what we did in that study is we worked with these um, mathematicians and we kind of created um, um, uh, a mathematical model that allowed you predict, depending on the characteristics of an individual patient, what the likelihood of an attack is. I can just tell you a little bit from that study here. I'm just looking at the at the table here because I, I I knew that this a question would come up, but I just thought it might be interesting. So this this these uh, this is an interesting paper because it provides these predictive tables where you can actually go down and look uh, uh, based on you know what type of attacks you've had, etc. What the likelihood of you having an attack in one year, five years, or twelve years is. And these 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 data were based on people that were on the immunotherapies that were available at that time. So it was actually quite concerning because if you looked at the likelihood, the, 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 the reduction in the likelihood of relapse in people that were on kind of standard immunotherapy before these trials, these therapies actually only had about a 30% reduction in the likelihood of relapse rate. It was not impressive. But uh, what we found was is that if you've had, for all patients, all NMOSD patients, regardless of how many attacks you've had in the past, 34% um, uh, of patients will have an attack in uh, the following year, and 54% of patients will have an attack in the following two years. So, you know, that's quite significant. And one of the things that was interesting was is that people that have had a shorter duration of disease, in other words, less than five years, those patients have a higher likelihood of having an attack than people that have had the disease for longer. So, um, so it's so you know it's, it's it's a significant risk at least based on the older therapies, and uh, again this paper I think was what really reinforced uh, us in our um, uh, endeavors to you know complete these three phase three trials, uh, which was ultimately to identify drugs that really have a proven robust benefit in terms of stopping relapses. Thank you so much, Dr. Pittock. The next question, if I have a relapse, will the new damage to my optic nerve and or spinal cord be permanent? Uh, let's start with you, Dr. Pittock, this time. So um, generally in rela with relapses in NMO, um, at least traditionally, and, and Dean and Brian Wenchenker did most of the work uh, showing that Relapses in NMO are really a lot worse than relapses in MS. In multiple sclerosis, patients tend to make near full recoveries in the early relapse remaining phase of their illness, whereas in NMO, the relapses are more severe. Having said that, you know, if you get in very early with steroids or even plasmapheresis, some are using that as their first line therapy, we do know that there is reversibility. Um, and many patients will get a good recovery from their attacks. Unfortunately, some patients are left with uh, significant disability. Um, so, and we really haven't made significant advances in our ability to reverse disability from a relapse because the treatments are pretty much the same. There are some obviously that use steroids first and others that are arguing that plasma phoresis should be considered as a first line therapy. Um, but regardless, we, we don't really have 
uh, uh, significantly new medication approaches to the management of relapse. So I think generally um, the fact that relapses in NMO do cause damage and that, and that that damage can be permanent, that again reinforces the argument and the reason to really try and aggressively stop clinical relapses. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Wingerchuk? Yeah, it's a, a great summary. Um, <clears throat> it is one of the things that we have difficulty predicting. And, you know, there are some attacks that uh, are, are quite severe and will recover very well, and other attacks that are more moderate but don't seem to recover very much. We're not very good at, um, at predicting what the outcome is going to be using tools, for example, such as conventional MRI scans, <clears throat> because they're, they're not really showing us, they're showing us where the lesion is or where the inflammation is, but they're not able to tell us um, whether there's, there's permanent injury to the, to the neurons or not. <clears throat> Usually what we're just looking at is, is a white spot that indicates there's more water in that area. That's it. But there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of interest in, in um, uh, new techniques, new imaging techniques in particular, that, that might be able to help that and, and certainly will be useful to do the kinds of research that uh, Sean was just referring to, new treatments for attacks themselves. Thank you both so much. Um, and so with these attacks, does nerve damage worsen over time? Um, so, and if so, how do you distinguish between worsening nerve damage and a relapse of the condition without something like a fever or severe weakness? Uh, Dr. Piddick? Well, that's a very good question. In fact, um, so one of the questions is, um, you know, in between attacks of NMOSD, uh, do people have ongoing nerve damage? Um, uh, is there kind of uh, ongoing irritation or immune-mediated destruction of the nervous system? And I think this is an extremely important question. And in fact, um, Dean Wingerchuk actually um, uh, wrote a paper showing that generally in NMOSD, we don't see, at least in the vast majority of patients, progressive disability in between relapses. And that's very different, you know, as you know, from MS, where in MS, the disability generally accrues because of the progressive neurodegenerative component, whether it be secondary progressive MS or primary progressive MS, uh, but not necessarily from the relapsing component of MS. And in fact, uh, if you look at the drug studies um, uh, and you read between the lines, you'll see that generally uh, in patients that don't have clinical attacks in the drug studies, we don't generally tend to see progression, at least over the short term, uh, one or two years of those drug studies. So I think generally we don't see progressive um, nerve damage in between clinical attacks. Or if it does occur, it's occurring at a very subtle level that probably warrants um, uh, quite detailed and maybe more sensitive analyses than using kind of the crude measures of disability that we use. Um, so I think it's certainly something that warrants a further investigation, but generally we think that once the attack is kind of finished, that in between attacks, things remain relatively uh, good. Um, uh, now, can people have kind of subtle attacks? I suspect that they can. You know, one of the things that I was thinking about when Dean was just talking about the last question was, um, you know, in the drug trials, um, we tended to see attacks that were not as severe as we thought they'd be. In fact, in the drug trials, there were a lot of attacks that, were, uh, that physicians thought patients were having. But at the end, the adjudication committee, when they looked at those attacks, actually felt that they weren't attacks. And that raises the question of, you know, when patients are on immunosuppressant therapies, maybe if they have an attack, their attack is actually milder than you would expect. So that being on an immunosuppressant medication to prevent attacks, if an attack occurs, it might actually dampen down the severity of that attack. So, um, so I think there's still a lot to obviously to learn, but 
you know, relapses, yes, we need to stop them. They do cause nerve damage, but whether there's kind of an ongoing irritation that's occurring subclinically uh, is a good question. I suspect it generally isn't happening as much as we think, but we do know that there are patients that have, you know, areas of enhancement on their imaging, on their MRI scans, but yet don't have any symptoms. And what does that mean? Does that mean that they have low grade inflammation, but they're not symptomatic? And maybe it means that we really need to start uh, using tools to uh, measure, you know, uh, subtle things um, uh, over a long period of time to kind of get a good sense of whether people are developing some uh, slow burning disability uh, in between relapses. Thank you. And Dr. Winger, took anything to add? Well, it's a great summary. And I think um, it highlights the importance, as was mentioned earlier, of attack prevention in this disease. I think, by and large, uh, it's, it's very likely to be true that for most individuals, <clears throat> if we were successful at preventing attacks, they would, they would remain stable. Um, they, they wouldn't get worse. Um, sometimes people feel like they're worsening or that their disease is progressing, but there's another explanation, like, for example, perhaps they've had <clears throat> myelitis in the past and have been left with some, uh, some weakness in, in one or both legs and some stiffness or spasticity. Well, sometimes that stiffness or spasticity can get worse, and that can interfere with function and make, make people think that the disease is worsening, but it's actually just a, uh, a, uh, an evolution over time of how the nervous system is adapting. It, it adapts by making the legs stiffer so that people are still able to stand and walk ra rather than have legs that are like, you know, cooked noodles. So um, each situation is different, but uh, uh, we, we, think that <clears throat> we think that because the attacks are the hallmark of the disease, that that's the real target. Thank you so much. The next question, can inflammation occur repeatedly in the same area, or is it likely to occur elsewhere in the central nervous system? And Dean, I'm going to turn to you, uh, Dr. Wigwichek, please. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, yeah, it's interesting. Some people have studied this in the context of both NMOSD as well as multiple sclerosis and found that um, there actually is a tendency for people to have recurrent events in the same system. So, for example, um, there are people who have NMOSD who have repeated attacks of optic neuritis, and for as long as they've, they're followed, don't have myelitis. And vice versa is also true. <clears throat> now, why that is is not entirely clear. Um, but I think that's a different point than inflammation recurring in exactly the same place. So, uh, the, you know, because, uh, or with the same symptoms, because that's what raises the question or the possibility of pseudo attacks. So what I mean by that is if someone says, you know, I've had 12 attacks this year, but then they tell me that each one of those attacks is exactly the same symptom. You know, my left leg gets a little bit weaker and then the next day it's better. It's extremely unlikely that each one of those is actually an attack. That sounds much more like a pseudo attack. Um, but the scenario of somebody having, you know, left optic neuritis and then two years later having right optic neuritis and then two years later another right optic neuritis, that kind of thing happens. And, <clears throat> it may be that there are, uh, uh, there are factors, individual factors, maybe genetic or otherwise, that influence uh, how, how this disease behaves. There must be something that explains um, why, it, it has, why there's an antibody that's present in, in you know, most people who have NMOSD, uh, yet it can behave differently from person to person. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Pitta? Yeah, no, I think Dean here? makes some very good points there. And actually, I, I think uh, in the, um, the app that Dean and the Guthies have been working on to help us um, define whether or not a patient is having an attack or not, I think brings up an important point that Dean was making there, which is that 
it's very, very important to compare to your to your pre pre baseline because, as Dean said, if you have a right optic neuritis and say you develop visual loss in the right eye, and then you're kind of presenting a year later complaining of maybe worsening vision in that right eye, it's very important to kind of be able to know what that baseline was. And obviously, if you have worsened, that would be evident, and you could diagnose a new uh, a new attack there. So just reiterating the importance of kind of having a very good baseline examination uh, so that you know what to compare these new symptoms to uh, can be very helpful in the clinic. And if you don't have that good baseline, it can be very difficult for a physician to actually define and be more definitive as to whether you have or, or are having an attack. Great, thank you both so much. Um, so then there, uh, the next question is, are subsequent attacks, so after the first attack, are subsequent, attack, subsequent attacks progressively worse in terms of symptoms and damage done? Um, and you know, are these relapses kind of treated any differently than that initial uh, presentation? Um, and do attacks, uh, the severity of attacks differ based on uh, whether or not someone is on a medication? Like, does medication kind of reduce the potential severity of the attack? Uh, Dr. Wingerchuk? Yeah, so, <clears throat> excuse me, generally speaking, attacks themselves are not necessarily worse, um, you know, over time or worth with, worse with successive attacks with regards to more inflammation, for example. However, <clears throat> if you have an optic nerve that was inflamed, you know, a couple years ago and took a hit and partially recovered, it's not going to have as much reserve. It's going to be more susceptible to damage from another recurrent optic neuritis affecting that same eye and may not recover as well. So <clears throat> um, it's kind of like it's kind of like just all of us getting older and you know not not healing or not recovering as well as we go decade by decade. Uh, you know, optic nerves or spinal cords that have been injured when they have another area of injury, then it's uh, it's a slower and usually less complete recovery. I think the other part of the question was <clears throat> the effect of medications. And this is also a, an area of active interest amongst uh, all of us who are involved in the, um, the project Sean was just referring to, to study the, the definition and um, judgments about whether relapses have occurred is relapse severity. So it is important to know whether an attack has happened. From the standpoint of studying the disease and studying the effects of medication, it's also very important to know um, whether we're having an effect on severity of attacks. And we think we, think we are. <clears throat> uh, we think that um, with, with probably also the older medications and certainly with the crop of newer ones that we've reduced not only the frequency but the severity of attacks. Thank you. And Dr. Pittick, anything else to add? No, I, I agree. Uh, we did look at this and, and you know, patients can have uh, a very bad, severe attack and then their next few attacks can be very mild and vice versa. Um, it's unfortunate that we just, we can't kind of predict whether an attack will be severe or mild. And, you know, there are some patients that can just, just have, you know, two attacks that are very, very severe and others that have multiple attacks and are mild and there's a big difference in the level of disability of those two patients and you know it, it all comes down to the fact that we really don't understand uh, all of the components that are involved in not only causing a relapse but whether you have a mild or a severe relapse the pieces of that puzzle are um, eluding us in many ways. I mean, we know that you have antibodies. We know that they they bind to the target. We know they cause counter activation. We know they lesion cells. But you know, you can have robust levels of antibody that has a robust ability to damage a cell, and yet you don't have a clinical relapse. So um, I think these questions are you know they're coming from the patients, and they're I think they're really brilliant questions, but they're questions that. Uh, ultimately remind us of the fact that we really have a lot more to learn.
Yes, and to that point, oh my goodness, I just looked at the clock. This time has just flown by, and this one I will direct to you, Sean, to take first. Uh, it's a, actually, it's a, the first question was if I'm on medication and I experience a relapse, should I switch medications? And then we've had one uh, of kind of a follow-on to that uh, that was submitted live. And, and the question was, if I've been on an immunosuppressant, yet I still experience an attack, should that particular drug be increased or changed? And what process is taken to come to that decision? So this is all about medications, relapses, and do you switch or change yeah, so medications? For me, that's kind of an easy question. The, the question that I find hardest is if I'm on a medication and I'm not having relapses, should I switch to one of the newer kind of proven medications. But in this situation, I would say if you're on a medication and you experience a relapse, for me, that's a big problem. Because at the end of the day, we've got to stop the relapses. We've got to prevent relapses. And if we can prevent relapses, I think we can make a huge impact for our patients. So if you're on a medication and you have a relapse, for me, that means that that medication is not working for you. Now, maybe you would have had two relapses if you hadn't been on the medication but for me, even having one relapse is not acceptable. So uh, if I had a patient that had a relapse on a medication, then I would look at the medications that are currently available. Uh, there are uh, going to be three medications that are proven in blinded, randomized, controlled uh, fashion trials. You know, these are, these are phase three trials to be a benefit. And I would consider one of those medications for that patient. Um, and uh, obviously, again, if they're on that medication, uh, even if they're from these phase three trials and they have an attack, then I would consider switching them to one of the other ones. Um, uh, in terms of vaccinations, you know, I think, um, uh, I don't think vaccination should be avoided because uh, back, I'm, I believe in vaccinations. Um, I know that there's some people that don't, but I think vaccinations have been very, very important um, um, in preventing disease. Um, also, there are some uh, therapies that we use that absolutely require vaccinations. For example, if you're considering something like eculizumab, we know that that drug can increase the risk of meningococcal infection. And so you absolutely have to be vaccinated against that if you want to go on that drug. Um, now, obviously, remember that some of these medications that we have patients on, they reduce the ability of your immune system to respond to a vaccine, and that needs to be considered also sometimes. Thank you so much. Dean, we're going to turn to you, please. Uh, any comments you would have? No, it's great points. I mean, you know, it's likely that some people listening are, <clears throat> are or know somebody who's on one of the, you know, one of the uh, existing older non-FDA approved medications. Uh, and sometimes there's issues there, you know, with the pills, for example, of um, the person not, not taking all of them or maybe being at a dose that's not adequate. And, and in some situations, uh, it does seem that the, the disease may have broken through just because the treatment wasn't optimized. But other than that, um, I completely agree with what Dr. Pittock said. If the disease breaks through significantly and you've got very good evidence for that, um, you really should be considering another drug. Great. Thank you both so much. And you know, I know we're at the end of our time, but I just wanted to open it up and see if you had any additional questions, any additional thoughts you wanted to add before we close today. Uh, Dr. Wojciechowski, do you want to? Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to answer um, or try to answer some of these really important questions. Hopefully, this overview clarifies, you know, in general terms, what we're trying to target with the disease and the, the fact that we've got some very exciting data now that for the first time strongly supports um, the impact that we're having and how much of an impact we're having. And I, I think the future looks very bright for our ability to, to build from there and work towards a cure. Great, and Dr. Pittick, any last thoughts? No, I, I just appreciate the opportunity and I'd like to thank the patients for their extremely good questions. And I think these questions are uh, questions that we as investigators need to be continually thinking about. 
and trying to um, move forward so that we can um, improve our knowledge and, and try and answer some of these questions better, hopefully in a few years. Great, thank you. I just wanted to thank you both so much for joining us and Jacinta for co-moderating with me. We really appreciate your time today. Thanks everyone. Thanks all, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.